Matthew chapter 3. As we continue in our series in the book of Matthew, and this morning we're going to uh, look at the theme about repentance, baptism, and ministry as we see it in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, here we're really jumping about uh, 28 to 30, 30 years from chapter 2 to chapter 3. As you see in chapter 2, uh, when we had uh, three wise men coming to visit Jesus in the house, and uh, uh, Joseph and Mary in exile in uh, uh, Egypt, uh, we don't know too much about Jesus' uh, upbringing. All that we know, that we know that he was a carpenter, and the most clear verse we have in uh, his years as a child and ministry is Luke 2.52, that says Jesus grew in wisdom and knowledge and in favor before God uh, and man. So now we're getting to chapter 2 where we're going to look at the ministry of John the Baptist and the baptism uh, of Jesus Christ. So this morning uh, I want to uh, read uh, the text uh, with us as we're reading uh, the text uh, and uh, uh, I want to us to uh, look at what God want to teach us this morning. And a couple uh, key verses in uh, uh, Matthew, uh, chapter 3 is verse 2 uh, and verse 8, uh, which we will uh, look into more details as we go. And here's the message in a nutshell. As Christ followers, we need to live as one, as people who have truly repented uh, of our sins and be fully devoted to God. As Christ followers, you need to live as one who has truly repented of your sins and devoted to God. So let's just read the text, and then we'll come back and walk through it uh, verse by verse. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and honey. Kids say, yuck. Say, yuck. Come on, kids, you can say it. You can say yuck in church. I look up a picture of a locust. It's not pretty this morning. <laughs> a locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. People are attracted to a guy like that. Wow. God must be good. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Wow, not pretty words. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. With sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John 
to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You're talking about miracle? That's miracle right there. Father, teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So three important aspects of the gospel that we see here in Matthew chapter 3. God wants us to repent. God wants us to be baptized. And he wants us to be ready to minister. God wants us to repent. He wants us to be baptized and wants us to minister. So repentance, repentance. Uh, what is repentance? Uh, a lot of time people, you know, when they repent, you know, to be uh, very emotional and uh, people crying, though it might include that, but repentance is not an emotional response, but rather a change in your thinking, a change in your heart, and a change in your actions. If you say that you repent, but you still live the same way, guess what? You have not repented. It doesn't matter how much tears that you have shed, how much crying, how much wailing, how much noise you've made. If you have not changed, you have not repentance. Re repent. Repent has nothing to do with the emotions. Yes, it might come with emotion, but if the emotions do not follow actions, you have not repented. You have not repented. What's wrong with me this morning? You have not repented. And repentance is not a one-time thing. A lot of us think the moment you walk uh, in front and then you said a prayer, you say you were repented, and you think you're good. And unfortunately, that's what is being sold in the church today. Telling you come forward, you say this prayer, and then your life will forever be changed and you never have to worry about your sin again. No, repentance is a daily thing. Do you still say mean things? Do you still get angry? See, that's why Jim says, confess your sins to one another so that you might be healed. Repentance is a daily thing that we constantly have to do so that we are living for God because God wants us to be fully devoted followers of him. Here, John preached a message of repentance. When John was preaching repentance, he was not calling the people to come and cry and wail. But what he was calling them to do was to change their thinking, to change their heart, because God says he will change their heart of stone into hearts of flesh. James was calling them to actions. James, uh, John was calling them to truly live for God. Because all of us know words are cheap. Okay, We can say things and not mean anything about it. Uh, we can say all that we want until the actions follows what we say. Then that's when we know that the words actually mean something. And, you know, our kids, you might just give them a spanking for something right now, and they cry, they cry, and then they go back and doing exactly what they just got a spanking for. Did they change? No. They were just enduring the pain, the consequences. You see, a lot of people cry over the consequences, how they've messed up their life. You see, the Bible talks about godly sorrow uh, versus remorse. See, a lot of time we see in the church when people come in and they're saying they repent, 
but it's really remorse. Remorse over how they have messed up their life, what they could have been and have not been yet. But it has nothing to do with repentance because if you had truly repented, their thinking would have changed, their heart would have changed, and their actions would be different. And here, John is calling us to repentance. It says, in those days, John the Baptist. You see, only Baptist has true doctrine. Hey, I'm kidding. That's a joke, okay? John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. They called John John the Baptist just because his main ministry was baptizing people, calling people to repentance, telling them the kingdom of God is at hand, and he was known to be baptizing people. His message was, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All the other gospel used the word kingdom of God, but since Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience, they didn't like to say the name of God because they want to take God's name in vain. So probably that's why Matthew here is using the word kingdom of heaven. It says, repent of your sins and turn to God. You see, repentance always come with a change. See, uh, it's a 180 degree turn. I was going this way, see, repenting, and then you turn to God. See, you cannot just repent and not turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So what, what uh, John was trying to teach them there is that, hey, this is serious. Uh, a lot of us think that you have all the time in the world to repent, but he's trying to say, hey, there's a time you will not be able to repent. It says, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It says the prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, and as you look in the book of Matthew, you see so many times it refers back to the Old Testament. And it's referring here to Isaiah talking about John. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. So John had a clear purpose and clear ministry for him to do. His mission was to be a voice shouting in the wilderness, preparing the way of the, Lord com the Lord's coming. It's weird to me. Why in the wilderness? You have such a great message to share. Uh, you go in the desert to share that message. It's preparing the way of the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. And John, just like uh, Jesus had like the virgin birth, miracle birth, John's birth was kind of miraculous too because his mother was up in age. His father was up in age. A uh, 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 mother was Elizabeth. His father was a priest. So John was a PK, you know, before it was preacher's kid. Uh, it was priest's kids. Uh, so uh, he would have been, you know, pretty much, you know, priest, you know, following his father's uh, footstep. But he went on and kind of took a different way. But the Bible refers to John um, in Luke 16, 16, Matthew 11, 11. He was kind of like the last prophet. Even though he appears in the New Testament, but he was the last prophet in the Old Testament. And Jesus, speaking of John, says, There is no other man born of women that is greater than John. This guy wearing camel's hair, clothing with a belt, and eating locusts and honey. Jesus said, Of men born on earth, nobody is greater than John. What was his mission? He sees a voice shouting in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord that's coming, clear the road for him. And that's what we saw when we studied the book of John in John 1.29, when, when, when John was preaching and then Jesus was passing by, John was the one who announced Jesus to the people. He says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in John 10, 39 to 42 and 42, it says, Jesus will forgive 
our sins and many people will believe in him. So John truly understood his purpose. John understood his mission. He knew that his mission was to go before Jesus and proclaiming Jesus. And he was obedient. And he did that and he did it well. In verse 4, John's clothes were woven from coarse camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. We don't know why. Why does he choose to eat locusts and wild honey? Speculations, locusts in the Bible is typically a picture of judgment. And honey, we saw that the Bible says to the, uh, the Jewish people that they go into a land filled with milk and honey. So this could be a picture of judgment and blessing. And then probably John chose to eat locusts and honey was to remind them, hey, judgment is coming. I should have brought you a picture of, of locusts. It's really ugly. Uh, <laughs> hey, judgment is coming. But you want to be blessed? Get some honey. Maybe that's why he was doing it. I don't know. But as we continue the text, that might support it because it's going to talk about baptism of the Spirit and baptism of fire. It's talking about separating the wheat from the chaff. Uh, maybe John, by eating locusts and honey, was trying to give them a picture of what is to come. If you follow God, you truly repent. Your life will be like honey, but if not, it will be uh, like locusts. We're going to have judgment come upon you, people from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and all over the Jordan River went out to see and hear John. That wild man attracted a crowd. It is amazing when you do what God tells you to do, it will work. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. When they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. So let's look at uh, a reference passage in Joel 2, 17 uh, to 32. In verse 17, it says, Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. And say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on the people. The Lord answered and said to his people, behold, I'm sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerners far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land. His vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul, and foul smell of him will rise for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and wine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication he has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And look at verse 25. I will do what? Say with me. Restore to you the years the swarming locust has eaten. The hopper, the destroyer, and the carter, my great army, which I sent among you. That's what God promised. God says, hey, when you repent, I will restore the years that the locust has stolen from you. John 10, 10, the devil come to kill, to steal, to destroy. But I have come to give 
you light. You see, the locusts were a sign of judgment. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else and my people shall never again be put to shame. And in verse uh, 32, it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what God wants for us. God wants you. God wants me to repent. And God says, hey, when we repent, he wants to use us. He wants to bless us. He doesn't want judgment upon us, but he wants to give us blessing. For when we repent, the blessing of God will be upon our life. You see, when we repent, it's an invitation to God to use us. Once we repent, it's an invitation that we give to God to use us. That you are saying, God, I am your servant, like Mary said. I am the Lord's servant. Do unto me as you desire. So repentance is very important. And we saw times and times again when the people of Israel, when they followed God, they were blessed. But when they did not, judgment came upon them. Then the next theme we see in that text is baptism. And baptism, as we know, in the Greek is the word baptizo. Uh, it means to submerge. It means like to uh, be drenched uh, 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 in water. It, it, it's a sign of your death. Uh, when you get baptized, you go down in the water. It shows that, A, hey, Jose's life is over today. And when you raise... Now you come into a new life. And it says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. See, John had no patience for those who were hypocrites. John had no patience for those who were hypocrites. You see, uh, repentance it's not for those, it's not just for those who've never known Christ and coming to God for the first time, but it's for the religious. The Pharisees were the religious leaders. The Sadducees were the religious leaders. They did not see eye to eye with each other. They were always uh, fighting with each other. See, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were so sad, you see. Oh, you'll get it on the way out. Uh, it says to them, you brood of vipers. He didn't have any patience for them. And Jesus didn't have any patience for the hypocrites either. Because Jesus called them whitewashed tomb. So for, 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 for him here, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming, it says, you brood of vipers or snakes. He exclaimed, who we'll warned you to flee the coming wrath? It says, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Here, you see, people in the church needs to repent too. And here, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they might have been in church. They might have been even the leaders in the church. But they were not repentant. And here, you know, we have a brand of Christianity now telling you, like, you're all good. Like, there's nothing bad. You will go hear sermons, but never hear the word sin. Uh, uh, it, it's just bad. God will always forgive. It's all, that's the message we like today. Uh, God will always forgive you. Yes, he will. But he also wants you to walk with him. And when, when we talk about repentance, you know, people won't even get mad. And that's why a lot of people, they are not saved. And they don't even know that they're not saved because we never talk to them about repentance. Like, oh, 
uh, they plan their sin, oh, God will forgive me. No, no, no. If you're planning your sin, you don't know God. It's that plain and simple. Because the Bible says, hey, those who love me, keep my commands. And here, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, John called them brood of vipers. John says, hey, verse 8, prove by the way you live that you have repentant of your sin. You have repented of your sins and turn to God. So John is telling them, uh, uh, you're not living. You're not turning to God. You're just doing your religious activity because you can be in church and still not be saved. Just like the Pharisees were the leaders in the church, and they were not even saved. Then it says, don't just say to each other, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. They were just saying, hey, we're good because we are descendants of Abraham. Pretty much John is saying, so what? It's as if we today saying, oh, I was born in the church. I grew up in the church. So what? It means nothing at all that you were born in the church. It means nothing at all that you grew up in the church if you are not living a repentant life. See, while you might be in the church and not be saved and somebody who just did all the wild things in the world but just come and just truly repent, go to heaven and you are not says, don't just say to each other, we are safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means, what? (laughs) Nothing. Being born in the church, grew up in the church, got baptized as a kid, doesn't mean anything, doesn't mean zilt, nada. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. So God can bring others to repentance. And in verse 10, even now, the acts of God's judgment is poised, ready to severe severe the roots of of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. These are not my words. It says that, hey, you bear good fruits. This is what's going to happen. But no good fruits. It says you're good for nothing. I'll read it again. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be what? Why don't you read it with me and be excited? Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. That's a picture of hell. Saying that as Christians, we need to bear fruit. I'm sorry, this is not the typical message that you usually hear, uh, but it's from our sponsor, the Bible. Verse 11, it says, I baptize you with water, those who repent of their sins and turn to God. You see, that's why I don't believe in infant baptism. I think we present kids to the temple and present kids in church. But you have to be baptized when you understand what you are doing. But it says, I baptize you with water, those who repent of their sins. As a baby, how can you repent of your sin? You cannot. So that's why baptism has to be done when you understand what you are doing, when you are able to articulate knowing what repentance is. It says, I baptize you with water, those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What a humble man. Jesus said of him, there's no greater man on earth than John that have been born of women. But here, so humble, he says he's not even worthy to 
tie Jesus' sandals. And it says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The Holy Spirit, Jesus promised us in John 14 and also John 16, telling us how the work of the Spirit will be done in our life. But also it says, be baptized with fire. Uh, here, uh, as we read verse 12, we see what he means by fire. He says, he is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat. See, when, when, when you're in the farm, you're getting the wheat, you're separating. The chaff is the bad stuff that you don't need. And the wheat is what you really need. He says he's separating them with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gather the wheat into his barn, and burning the chaff with what? Never-ending fire. But the baptism of fire could also be, you know, God refining you when you're getting your problems it's kind of like God is refining you. When, John, when James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials for the testing of your faith will produce what? Steadfastness. See, sometimes it's kind of like you're going for a baptism of fire, but I think it's more of a reference to hell, and I think that's what the Holy Spirit does to us. The Holy Spirit is the refiner. In Malachi uh, 3, verse 2 and 3, it talks about refiner's fire. Uh, you see, but I think that's more the work of the Holy Spirit. But here I think what the reference here, baptism of the of fire, uh, has to do uh, with hell. Look at John 14, 16, and 17 about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he will send the Holy Spirit. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. And in Acts 1, 5, we saw the Holy Spirit came upon them. In John 16, 7 to 13, it tells us about the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it says that, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. That's Jesus speaking. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. The helper is the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, that's the third person of the Trinity. We call God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So when you feel guilty, when you feel convicted about your sin, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why every Christian has to have the Holy Spirit in their life. Because if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you just go about your sin and never feel any conviction, be very scared. But when the conviction comes, you act on the convictions. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and I will, uh, you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all the truth. So you have the guidance from the Holy Spirit. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And now look at John 15, verse 1 to 6. It says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he does what? Takes away, or he prunes. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word, word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So you see, that's kind of like why some people believe baptism of fire can also be a pruning process for believers. Okay, 
Uh, but as we continue here, you'll see a couple verses that are scary. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And look at verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is what? Thrown away, away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. The safe things, be baptized by the Holy Spirit, okay? Leave the baptism of fire to those who are perishing. Uh, but here, you know, God has a way of refining us. But eventually, as we are, if we're not walking with God, we are not repentant, judgment is coming that's why God calls us to repentance, and the next step after we repent is to be baptized. And now we conclude the passage as we look at the baptism of Jesus. It says, then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, but John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you. He said, so why are you coming to me? Why does Jesus need to be baptized? Jesus is perfect. He never committed any sin. But you see, the baptism of John was a foreshadowing of showing that the Messiah is, is coming and getting, uh, and Jesus is our example, the Bible tells us. And Jesus here was standing in our place just like we need to stand. And Jesus says, I call you to be baptized, and I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to stand and show you the example where I got baptized, and you see the seal, the Holy Spirit come down as a dove, and you hear the Father says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. So if you are a believer, you need to follow Jesus' example, and you need to get baptized. It's interesting to see how many people have been in church all their life, uh, but never get baptized. There's always a hang-up. Baptism seals the deal. It's just like a wedding ring. You're already married to Christ. Now you wear your ring, and now that seals the deal. Oh, I don't have my ring, okay? I'm still married, okay? See, that's the thing. I'm still married, if no, I don't have my ring on right now. But that's what baptism does. Hey, you belong to Christ. You show it. You make it public that you are Christ. And after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. A voice from heaven says, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. Jesus brought great joy to God. As Jesus came in his humanity, he did everything that God has called him to do. Here we see, we saw Joseph was very obedient, Mary was very obedient, and here what do we see again? John, very obedient, and Jesus in his humanity, very obedient to the call of God in his life. That's why our theme this year is God rewards obedience. Obedience is very important, important theme in the Bible God wants you and God wants me to be obedient. In Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And then what's the word there? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So God wants us to repent. And as we repent, he says the next step is for us to get baptized to show our commitment to him and then lastly uh, <coughs> not only when we repent then we get baptized show our commitment then God has a ministry for all of us just like God had a ministry for John God has a ministry for you to do uh, God wants you to reach others for him as well so what can we learn from John in order to uh, effect to be effective uh, in our own ministry that God will call us to. What can we learn from John? Uh, the first thing we saw from John, he was very humble. 
although he had a great mission, uh, God had a great call on his life, but he was very humble about it. It was not about him. It was all about doing the work of God. Hey, when he saw that Jesus came, he was ready uh, to pass the mantle. Because he says, I must decrease and he must increase. For John, the message was much more important than him. And so many of us, when we have a ministry, we get so full of ourselves. It's all about us. But we uh, do not see, you know, when God is using somebody else. And here, John was ready and he was willing, Lord God, when he saw Jesus, to focus on the greater message and pass the mantle to Jesus. He was very humble. He also was bold, in which a lot of us need today, boldness, boldness in our faith. John, he's not the one that you would leave and not know what he was trying to communicate. Uh, you will know exactly what he meant to say and what he had purpose to say in that moment. You will live with no doubt exactly what he wanted to get off his chest. John was very bold in his message. He was very direct and decisive. He told them, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Was that clear? Very clear. He's calling them to repentance. And here in our culture today, everybody is good, right? Uh, it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's, we, we, we even have different words for sin now, okay? Uh, uh, even in our resume, when people lie, they don't use the word lie anymore. They say, oh, he just embellished the resume. You see how we're staying away, like, from what we really do? Like, we, wanna, we don't want to take any consequences for our uh, actions, Okay? Uh, uh, God calls us to repentance. And it's okay to tell people, hey, they need to repent of their sins. Sin is a real problem. If they don't have any sin, they're already good, then they do not need a Savior. And God is their Savior. John was humble. He was bold. He was very purposeful. He only cared about that one thing, preparing the way of the Lord. And too many of us today live without any purpose. We're just going through life. We're just going and living for the next thing. Uh, we, we don't, we, we're going aimlessly. And we know that when we aim at anything, we're going to hit it every time. We will aim at, we will hit nothing every time. See, John had a very purposeful life, and as a result, he was very effective in his ministry, even though his life was very short because he was killed by the king, probably in his very early uh, 30s. But not a, a short life doesn't make a difference. We still talk of Mar Martin Luther King today. He died at 39 years old. So it's not about the length of your life. It's about how you live your life. See, John was very purposeful. What I call him, he was single-minded. He was a one-mission man. He was about Jesus Christ and make sure that everybody know that he was the Lamb of God who can take away our sin. Only Jesus can. And the only way that Jesus can change your life is if you repent. We saw John was very discerning in his ministry. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, he already knew that they were the fake ones. They were the hypocrites. They were not real. They needed to repent. And I know a lot of time, because we might see people in the church and we don't call them to repentance, but some other people, it's not just people out there that needs to repent, but it's people in here also that needs to repent. And John was very discerning. He could see that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he called them by their name. He called them for who they were. They were brood of vipers. They were not will. They were whitewashed tomb. And he discerned 
that they were not really following Christ. And then lastly, he was not afraid to be different. And all of us wants to just conform to the world now, conform to how everything is going in the world. We don't want to, in, to offend anybody. But John was not afraid to be different. He was who he was. He was who God has called him to be. And God calls us to stand out and be different, especially today. They're trying to put everybody in the same mold. But Romans 12 tells us, hey, don't conform to the mold of this world. But it says to be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that by testing you may know the will of God in your life. A question for you this morning. Are you bearing fruit in keeping with repentance? Are you bearing Christian fruits? Can people see the way that you live? reflects who you say you are, reflects your faith? Are you living as you claim to be? Are you living as you claim to be? And can God say about you that he delights in you just like he said to Jesus, that he delighted to Jesus? Can God say that he delight in you? See, that's the call for us this morning. We need to live as we claim to be. Otherwise, we are not truly walking with him. So the message in a nutshell is verse 8 of chapter 3. In the New Living Translation, it says, Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Can you say it with me? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sin and turn to God. Father, help.